Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rethinking Resources podcast, brought to you by OMV. We are your hosts, Julie McCarthy. And I'm Steve Shade. Steve and I are two independent radio journalists who will be taking you inside the biggest challenges we're facing in the climate change transformation. Our topic this first season is the circular economy, a hugely exciting concept full of promise. Yes, indeed. The circular economy aims to close the loop, so to say, by using and reusing resources more efficiently and eliminating waste. New solutions are being created to eliminate waste, to increase efficiencies and also reach climate goals. In this episode, we will be telling you about the Holy Grail Project, one of the most exciting and ambitious initiatives to revolutionize plastic packaging. This project is driven by the European Brands Association and powered by the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Holy Grail promises to truly close the loop by using a smart system to put a special invisible marker on plastics and other types of packaging at the point of production. And this marker means that plastic packaging won't end up littering our landscapes, clogging our waterways, or being incinerated because it can be identified in the waste disposal system, sorted, recycled, and reused. To tell us about the Holy Grail project, we are joined now by Hien de Belda. Hien is a packaging expert at Procter & Gamble and project leader for Holy Grail. Hien, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me to this podcast on circular economies. Thank you so much for joining us uh, from my part to Kian today. Uh, now, you've led a coalition of companies in search of the Holy Grail. It started out as a handful of companies initially, and now 170 plus companies are on board making this happen. Tell us a bit about what lies behind Holy Grail and what it promises to deliver. Yes, so Holy Grail is the solution the globe needs for better recycling of your empty packages. For a too long time, people have been frustrated by seeing pictures and movies of garbage floating in our oceans and rivers impacting wildlife. There is a solution to it, but it requires a full value chain, including you as listeners to this podcast, to collaborate. Let me explain it in a bit more detail. Brand owners and retailers, basically the producers of your daily products, have to design their packages so that they can be recycled. This is even the case for reusable and refillable packages that one day have to be recycled as well. Then we heavily rely on governments to ensure there is a waste infrastructure in place, including separate collection of empty packages. In most European member states, such systems do exist. Think about the collection bin system in Germany and Austria. Next to that, we also rely on you, the consumer, to ensure he or she is doing the right thing when the product is being consumed. That is, to place it into the right collection bin. By all means, we have to prevent that consumers would litter their packs, as this contributes even more to the global waste crisis. I fully understand that sometimes placing empty packs, being either plastic, paper, aluminum or even compostables in the right bin is a very difficult task. We need to work on better sorting instructions for consumers, and that's the first help that Holy Grail can provide. A second help is in the sorting centers. When the yellow bins are, collect are being collected at your doorsteps by waste trucks and sent to such sorting centers, their job is to sort on different material types. Holy Grail definitely can improve current systems in place. And last but not least, we need to close circles, and that's once more the job of brand owners and retailers but also for recyclers that receive the sorted materials from the previous step and produce new materials out of them that brand owners and, and retailers then use again in their packages. This allows to make new packages out of recycled materials. If you go shopping next time, you will see some of our brands already have high loading of recycled materials, such as even up to 100%. So I'm just gonna show quickly two examples. So what you see here is a transparent dish fairy bottle um, and the bottle itself already contains 100% recycled materials. The second example I'm, I'm showcasing here is a white uh, Pantene bottle, uh, shampoo bottle, and also this package already contains 100%. So I think these are two proofs um, that really showcase that you can actually load packages uh, with only recycled 
materials. Kian, I wanted to ask you about the, the big remaining bottlenecks in the system. Uh, it's clear that consumer behavior needs to evolve, but don't waste collection systems on a massive scale need to be on board to really make this work? That's a uh, that's correct statement. So indeed, I mean, the two big bottlenecks to, to bring us to much higher recycling rates, uh, uh, especially for plastics, but also for other materials, um, are twofold. So indeed, as you mentioned, the consumer needs to act. Um, if the consumer is just putting their empty packages in their standard waste bins, uh, we're never going to find them back in, in sorting centers and they never will be sent to, to recyclers. So that's definitely an, a big one. Um, and it's again our job to better educate the consumer and potentially provide incentives to do so. So that's the first big bottleneck. And then the second big bottleneck is indeed to improve the system um, of sorting. I have seen way too many um, bad examples where packages have been correctly designed, but because the uh, sorting equipment is not fully developed, um, those packages unfortunately were sent into the wrong stream and also would end up um, as uh, waste um, eventually being incinerated at all. And so the big focus of Holy Grail is really to focus on that second bottleneck. It's really to drastically um, improve and revolutionize uh, sorting and come up with a better system versus the current standard one. So we're pretty, f we're pretty far with it already then. So it's, a, it's close. It's, it's at our fingertips, so to say. Yeah, it sounds like we're right on the threshold of it being rolled out in a, in, in a big way. Uh, Hien, let's talk about how it actually works. Uh, Holy Grail involves the use of this, this digital watermark that is invisible to the human eye. So packaging and products appear normal to the human eye, but when these things are disposed of, uh, then one of the biggest problems in sorting and recycling becomes a lot easier to solve. Uh, this is where the real magic happens. Explain how it works with this invisible watermark. That's uh, fully correct, Steve. So in essence, we make the package indeed intelligent by the implementation of the so-called digital watermarks, which are basically very tiny codes uh, the size of a, of a post stamp. So the way we are doing this, think about um, a kind of a Photoshop manipulation of the, of the artwork, of the label, for example, onto your, your bottle. You bring in cer small dots in, in certain areas, which the human eye can't see. Um, and as an example, again, I'm just going to show you again the same package that I also already have been sharing. So the Ariel uh, flexible packages. Um, and what we would be doing here is that I'm using the existing white ink, uh, which you can see on the bottom of the package. Um, and I put small white dots in the green area here and vice versa. I use the existing green and I put very small green dots in that white area, right? So the whole um, surface of this package would contain codes which you and I can't see, but which can be easily captured by uh, simple cameras uh, as the one on, on, on people's uh, smartphones, um, as an example. Um, and we do exactly the same in, um, in, in a sorting center. We are just then using much more sophisticated uh, cameras, right? Um, and so that's really the, the magic behind the, uh, behind the technology. Um, so this is, this is definitely focusing on, on, you know, on, on the sorting bit. But as I explained before, um, this intelligence now also can be used by, by you, the consumer. Um, because sometimes if you're traveling, um, you are always, you're not always knowing where to place your empty packages, right? So if I go on holidays, Corsica, wherever it's going to be, um, I have no idea how to sort my empty bottles. Now, my mobile phone knows where I'm located. Um, the app actually can link it to the local sorting instructions. So whenever I would scan my intelligent packaging, the app will tell me, please put me in that certain collection bin, that color, whatever it's going to be, right? So this is also making use of the intelligence uh, that we are bringing in with these type of um, uh, digital watermarks. Um, so when I said before, this is really the solution for better recycling of, of your empty packages. So Holy Grail picks you up at all points on the value chain so the consumer can find out where they need to dispose of, of, of the packaging. And then once it gets into the sorting process, the, the even more specialized cameras pick it up and sort it at that point. Um, you just held up this, this, this package that would be similar to a box I would see on a shelf if I went into a supermarket. Um, 
Can you demonstrate it? Do you have an app on your phone that allows uh, your phone to react to it? What, sure. what actually happens if I am on, uh, on vacation in Corsica or somewhere else, or if I go shopping um, here where I'm located in Vienna, if I, if I go into a store and I point my smartphone at a, at a package, what actually happens? Yes, thanks for the question. So indeed, let me give you a very quick uh, demonstration. And um, I hope the, the, the viewers actually can, can see it. They're also here on my screen. So I'm just holding... If they're not um, watching, I'll narrate it a little bit. So now you're, you're holding up what would look like the flat surface of a, a box of detergent. Correct. Okay, so you, you hold that now. If you point your smartphone at if it, now, indeed, activating the camera. Open the, uh, the app, you see that there is an, uh, a signal re registered. So there, it can Okay, read. so your, your phone immediately reacted to it. You, you put the camera on it, and then I saw that something happened on the screen. What was that? Correct. So it's it's picking up the signal, and then uh, the brand owners and the retailers actually then can direct it to a certain website, for example. So in this case, I'm being directed to the <coughs> German uh, Ariel website, where you can get more information about this product. But also you can then obviously link it with local sorting instructions, right? So we just made that package intelligent, and by just you know pointing your phone into that intelligent packaging. Uh, it's picking up a signal and then we can program whatever we want to, um, to, to, to program in there, right? So um, sorting instructions is definitely uh, a big one because we have been seeing so many different sorting instructions um, for different countries that it's really becoming very messy. Um, I'm living in a very small uh, country called Belgium. Um, we typically are getting quite a lot of products uh, coming out of, uh, of France. And uh, in a lot of cases, actually, um, I'm getting French uh, sorting instructions on my pack, which are totally irrelevant for Belgium, right? So by digitizing, we, we do hope that that's going to facilitate the job for, for consumers um, and bring in less confusion for him. And let me pick up on that. Julie has a question, too. But so if it is a holy grail project, if it has the invisible watermark, and the cameras detect it, that means it prevents that product from being sorted incorrectly, it stays in the loop, it doesn't get incinerated, it doesn't end up someplace it shouldn't be, it's, it's, it's in the closed loop and can then be recycled and reutilized. That's fully correct, uh, Steve, yes. It's fascinating and very uh, innovative, of course, but it doesn't let us off the hook, does it? As consumers, we still need to take the packaging and bring it somewhere to a specific place, think about it, uh, in order for it to end up being in the right place, in order for it to be then reused, recycled, uh, etc. That's, uh, that's also a correct uh, statement. So it's all about closing the circles, right? So the first thing that needs to happen is indeed uh, having the right consumer action. If, if you have your, uh, your bottles and you just put them in your classical waste bin, well, uh, those bottles will be incinerated, right? Hopefully with, with some energy recovery. Uh, certain countries are still using, unfortunately, landfill as well. Uh, but it's all indeed about the action from the consumer to put it in the right bins. If you put it in the right bins, then chances are very high that it's going to get um, correctly sorted um, and obviously also then being sent to a recycler, which then will treat it uh, and make new um, useful resources uh, out of it. Um, I think the classical example, is, is uh, which is already in place on a big scale, I would say, <clears throat> is the example of your classical soda bottles, right? Your PT bottles, um, water bottles, soda bottles, whatever it is. Um, there's quite a lot of, of collection in place already. Um, in Europe, numbers are very high in terms of collection. In Belgium, we are collecting 91%, uh, I believe, of all of those water, water bottles. Again, very similar. If I put it in my collection bin, it's picked up by the waste truck, it's being sent to a sorting center, they are then sorting on materials, so all of the PT bet, uh, bottles will go into a bale. It's being sent to a recycler and he's making basically uh, new um, uh, P PT uh, material out of it, which we call then post-consumer recycled material, which we then can use to be placing back into our bottles. Uh, now we come to the big problem. So we've talked about how it can work, how it should work. Uh, let's talk about the problems and what, uh, what, what's likely to prevent it from working. So uh, what are the big remaining bottlenecks? Uh, we know that if consumer behavior does evolve, people are putting things in the right place, great. But waste collection systems on a massive scale need to be on board to make this really work. Um, the, the, there's certainly gonna be packaging that's a lot more difficult to deal with. 
where are the big problems? How will they be overcome? Yes, it, it all comes back to the, the first bullet points I've, I've been mentioning, right? So again, yes, all of our governments um, have implemented systems um, like collection schemes and so forth. But unfortunately, it's, it's not harmonized. So if you travel from one country to another, it's, it's, it's very confusing for consumers. And sometimes even within the same country, um, there's another collection scheme in place. Um, and so there is definitely work that needs to happen by, by governments uh, trying to, to um, harmonize it even, even better, uh, especially between countries. Even thinking about similar bin colors for all over Europe, right? So if you then travel within Europe, at least you know that the yellow bin is always a bin that you should use for, for plastic items as an example, right? Um, harmonization of sorting constructions, uh, instructions and so forth, also very important. Um, but as I mentioned as well, the two big bottlenecks today to increase recycling rates of any type of material, including plastics, it's basically twofold. The first one is really we are not collecting enough material in the bins, right? So there is definitely a shortage on the amount of collected items. If I look on the um, average numbers for Europe, 66% um, of the PT bottles, or so your soda bottles again, are being collected. Um, it looks like a high number, but it's not, right? Um, so there is much more effort that needs to be done in order to close the circles because everyone would like to load those bottles with 100% PCR and it's only going to happen whenever we have, you know, more material at hand. Um, some of the recycling plants currently have, are, are running on, under um, lower capacities that they actually can handle, right? Simply because there is not enough material for them. So bottleneck number one is definitely convince consumers, um, even by maybe in the future incentives, to collect more materials into their collection bin. The second. That's an important point. Let me, let me, oh, sorry to interrupt you between your, your, your first and second points. I, I just wanted to highlight something because I've heard people within the plastics industry specifically say plastic is too valuable to throw away. Uh, the problem was it was so difficult to collect and sort and, 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 and recycle up until now, but Holy Grail goes a, a long step towards solving that problem. Just wanted to, to interject that. Please go on with your second point. No, thanks. I mean, it's, it's, it's right. So I think I said, I mean, yes, we, we, we have to rely on those consumers, but we also need to make it much easier for the consumer, right? And again, by scanning it and by, you know, making it digital that consumers know what to do with, because that's where the confusion comes. I mean, that's definitely the first biggest uh, bottleneck. The, the other big bottleneck then is indeed sorting. And, and I've seen uh, and have been very frustrated um, in the past that whenever you're designing products correctly, and products that are then definitely can be recycled, there's quite a lot of things that are going wrong during that sorting step. That was one of the reasons, the frustration, my personal frustrations on, on some of our products that were perfectly designed for recyclability, but then ended up, unfortunately, also in, in a rest fraction because of the wrong sorting, right? And that's, that was the passion, at least for me, to, to start this program back in 2016 um, and started uh, investigating what are the different ways we can improve sorting um, by making that package more intelligent. So that, that basically was the work we started under the new plastics economy from the uh, Alan McCarter Foundation, which eventually is now indeed involving in, in Holy Grail 2.0, um, the, the initiative um, which is uh, driven by the European Brands Association and powered by the Alliance and Plastic Waste. So those are really two big bottlenecks that hopefully through uh, Holy Grail we, uh, we can crack. So you mentioned there, Jan, that uh, quite a high percentage of, for instance, plastic bottles, the PET bottles, so to say, are being recycled. But overall today, it's only a very small fraction, actually, of plastic packaging that is being recycled. Uh, what will be made possible by Holy Grail? Like, what, what amounts are we talking about here? What efficiencies are we really talking about? Yes, thanks, uh, Julie, for the question. Indeed, I mean, I've mentioned the, um, the data on PT bottle and PT bottles are, are seen in the world as being um, the best collected and recycled material, right? 66% collection, probably recycling rates of only 30%, right? Um, global numbers, right? 30. Um, if I look to the European average numbers for, for recycling of plastic packaging, we are currently roughly uh, um, around 42%. 
that are being recycled uh, in Europe. Um, but obviously, the European Commission has put uh, quite some ambitious new targets. So that number needs to go to 50% by 2025 and 55% by 2030. So urgent action is needed, right? Um, and so, as said, I mean, 66% for PT, the highest number. I don't have the real numbers on other packaging formats, but indeed it's true that certain packaging formats are suffering big time from recycling. And some of them are even not recycled. So it's all about, you know, um, get them into the collection schemes because not all of the packaging formats Think about film packages. Uh, not all of them are already accepted in collection schemes. Um, not all of them are sorted and sent to recyclers. So that's really the urgent action that we need to do. Now, to your question, uh, yes, we have been making an, an estimation uh, what Holy Grail truly can bring. And the best estimate that we can provide today is that roughly 2,500 kilotons per year extra recycled material could be placed into the market in Europe, which is really a massive, massive number, right? I think we all um, have seen that a lot of the brand owners and retailers, but also governments are putting um, out there quite a lot of pledges, um, commitments to put recycled materials um, into, the, into their packages. And there is simply not enough today, right? So uh, the more we can actually save from being either incinerated or being sent to landfills, the better. Um, and I said 2,500 kilotons extra per year is a massive number. Um, we hope we can achieve that one through, uh, through indeed Holy Grail. 2,500 kilotons. Okay, I'm trying to picture that number. It's not easy. It sounds like a massive amount, obviously. But if you look at the big picture, um, how does that really contribute to the circular economy and actually reaching climate goals in general? Yeah, so I think, I mean, if you look to that picture, it's, it's probably, again, I should make the calculations, but it's probably reflecting something like 20% uh, additional capacity for Europe. Um, so it's, it's, it's I said, a, a pretty high number. Um, the other thing is that um, the current recycling capacities in Europe, they also take into account what I would call open loop recycling, right? So you have certain items, you send it, um, and it's ending up in a another application. I think the, the trick for circular economies, it's, it's really all about closing the loops, right? So the best example is again, that soda bottle going back into a soda bottle. But what we also would like to develop with Holy Grail is to create markets, for example, from a detergent bottle to a detergent bottle, from a cosmetic hair care bottle to another cosmetic hair care bottle, from a feminine hygiene application into another app feminine hygiene application, right? So it's all about closing loops. And that really can um, create a big impact for, for the circular economy um, in general. Hien, you touched on this earlier, but let's, let's highlight it and, and make it really clear. Um, this goes way beyond plastic packaging, right? Uh, this invisible watermarking technology can be used on, on any kind of packaging, from paper to multi-layer containers, uh, even textiles, I imagine. So give us some examples of, of all of the possibilities. Yep. Indeed. Um, the focus currently for us is obviously on, on, on packaging. Um, that's already <laughs> a challenge enough, I would say. It's a big challenge, as, as you've heard. And it's very complex. The waste industry is very complex and all of the, 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 you know, the value chain uh, players involved, it's, it's, it's a big amount of people, right? So our key focus is indeed on packaging. That being said, you can easily reapply it on automotive, uh, items, uh, PVC windows, uh, artificial flooring, potentially textiles and others. But let's first prove that it works on, on packaging. You rightly said indeed um, that it's more than plastics. Um, in the testing in Copenhagen, we have been testing quite a lot of different materials, including paper-based items, um, including liquid carton boards and others. Um, so yes, for the time being, the national test markets, we are just going to focus on plastics, liquid carton, um, liquid carton board, sorry, and then also some of the, the paper packages, all of which um, really need to have a better granularity on, uh, on sorting. Now, as said, I mean, it also can be reapplied onto other packaging materials or, or outside of packaging, uh, but we really first would like to prove and uh, focus on those items that currently are suffering 
from low recycling uh, numbers and really pump up those type of, uh, of numbers um, by implementing this type of technology. He and a very important thing I wanted to come back to was the cost. Uh, you mentioned this earlier, uh, with all the significant investments required for watermarking technology, for, for, for the, the very specific and um, high-tech cameras that are involved, perforting, uh, perfecting the sorting step. The big question, who's paying for this all? Um, Investment is, is required up front, but does, does this mean consumers are going to pay for it at, uh, at, at, at checkout? Or, or will the cost be shared all along the value chain? Yeah. Very good question. So I think as mentioned, I mean, for the time being, we're still in a, in a kind of an R&D program. So um, all of the, uh, the initiative itself is, as mentioned, driven by AIM and, and, and financed by the Alliance and Plastic Waste, right? So in terms of the costs, to prove uh, the technology uh, we're fully financed. Then indeed, if we go longer term, if we have a look longer term, there are basically two different parties that, that need to invest. On the one hand, you have the brand owner and the retailers. It's all about uh, paying a licensing cost to use, the, to, to use this um, digital watermark technology. But as I said, there are potentials for us then to compensate those type of costs by lower extended producer responsibility fees, as an example, right? Um, I think this is something we are not going to reflect on, on the consumers. I uh, don't see any reason why we should be doing this, because there are um, other values for us. Um, I said lower EPR fees, but then also having more access to high quality um, recycled streams that we can put back into, um, into the package itself. So that's the first Wait, now, one. We're on the verge of something super exciting here. This is, so if, if things can be collected and sorted and recycled properly, are we now into a level where it pays for itself? That's what we're targeting for, yes. But obviously it's coming with a lot of ifs, 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 <laughs> as usual in sustainability. Or it depends, right? That's, that's the other thing the, that you will hear quite a lot if you're asking questions. Um, but I think the technology should be implemented uh, at a cost-neutral uh, uh, position for consumers, right? So I don't, I don't see any reasons why consumers should pay more uh, for this one. Now, what I want to know is, when will I be able to go into a shop, into a store here in Vienna, where we live, um, and find this digital watermark on a product? Good question. So I didn't mention Austria yet as being part of the national test markets, but what I can tell you is that certain of the products that we as PNG are putting in the German market actually do share their artwork, their labels also with Austria. So the examples I've shown on these Ariel pots um, also already are in the Austrian market and will have the watermark um, already um, in there, right? But again, I think we all have to move um, all of the brand owners, retailers have to move into that technology before we can ask consumers really to start scanning packages, right? So either we all move together and we can convince consumers to start scanning. Because again, I mean, one of the disadvantages here is that consumers can't see it, right? If I just put there a QR code and consumers, thanks to COVID, everyone takes his phone and starts scanning a QR code these days. Uh, but on, in this case, um, it's even invisible to consumers, and so I, I don't think we should start asking them to start trying to scan certain packages. We first need to have a critical mass in place, because otherwise he's just going to scan and going to be very disappointed that certain articles do have them already and others don't have them, right? So it's just going to take somewhat more time to, to start with the consumer engagement piece, I believe, yes. Hien, let's stay with the look of the packaging, uh, because the invisibility of this digital watermark is, is so important. Uh, we, we really can't underestimate how important it is for global brands to be immediately recognizable, right? You know, they invest millions in these iconic looks for certain packages, so you can't come out with something new that changes the look of the, of the packaging. Um, so the, this, this invisible watermark doesn't interfere with the normal look of the product and makes it all possible. That's correct, uh, Steve. So again, I'm, I'm working in, in one of the, <laughs> the biggest marketing companies. Um, and obviously there's always some tension if I'm, as an R&D person, am asking to change something on the artwork, as you can imagine, right? Um, it's so unthinkable it's, to take an iconic project, uh, some, some product, I mean, 
as a consumer, we're used to seeing things on the shelf, but yeah, you know exactly what is behind that. And if you're in an R&D and go and say, oh, we want to change this, go uh, ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, to, to come back to the previous discussion. So imagine that um, I'm asking my marketeers to put like uh, 20 QR codes on a pack just for the recycling, right? They're never going to buy into that one, right? Because I'm completely am destroying their, their artwork. So Indeed, market, marketeers and designers like to keep their brand equity. Uh, so it's very important to implement this uh, intelligent technology without disturbing the look of the package, right? Or the brand equity itself. So again, what, what you see here, and I just will describe it again um, for the people that are listening to the podcast, is a refill system uh, for shampoos. And as you can see, the brand equity, it's, it's blue and white mainly, right? Um, so imagine mm -hmm. if I'm coming now with um, an enhancement strategy where this pouch itself would become more yellowish, right? A marketer or um, a designer never will accept that. So it's very important indeed to hide the coding systems so that there is no impact for the consumer whatsoever. Point taken. Yeah, it's... it's it, it's it's really phenomenal, you know. You hold up a package like that, and 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 I'm thinking, hmm, product for me. Julie's thinking product for her, maybe maybe not. Um. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, you know, products they 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 rely on the immediate recognizability of yeah, the colors that are used, and uh, obviously the, the logos that they look exactly a certain way, and the way that we're all used to it. Because suddenly people are going to start thinking, oh, that's it's a fake, or no, it doesn't look like that usually. Why does it look different suddenly? And people. People don't tend to like that too much. We all know that. Um, another question. Now, it's very impressive that formerly fierce competitors are actually cooperating now to make this work. Uh, how did you manage to recruit support from your former adversaries? Excellent question again. Um, indeed, um, I think if, if we would have tried this one back in 2014, it never would have worked, right? Because I think at that moment in time, all of the companies were very closed. We were not supposed to be working with uh, direct competitors and so forth. And look at this initiative. I mean, 170, as mentioned, 52 brand owners and retailers. And I think the majority, the main competitors of, of P&G are actually now in the initiative. Now, it's my, my belief that circular economy only can work at scale if we all work together, including your competitors, right? So I think, again, this is a nice example where we would like to revolutionize the waste sector. And it's only going to work when, when we all working together on a very similar agenda, right? It's all about designing where we would like to go as an industry and trying to align what is really the best technology that will get us there. Uh, he and the name. Holy Grail it is a very big promise. Uh, dramatic name. Cool name, by the way. Good marketing there. Are we going to uh, talk about the, the Monty Python film now? Yeah, as well? <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy <laughs> Grail. <that> <laughs> uh, of course, there's a more serious intention behind the name Holy Grail. Uh, ultimately, this is the promise of eternal youth, sustenance, uh, infinite abundance. So assuming you're able to close the loop with Holy Grail, how long can plastics, how long can packaging be eternally recycled and reused? It really depends then on the recycling processes uh, being used, right? So what we currently have in the market are really more the, the classical mechanical recycling processes, which are in place for plastics and fibers. Um, and what's really um, the challenge on, on those ones is that indeed they always would come with some kind of degradation of the material, right? So for example, if you take a paper package, uh, you probably can just recycle it uh, three, three times or so. Um, so over time, there's always a kind of, of, of degradation and it's exactly the same for, for plastics, although uh, you, you can live with somewhat more cycles. Now, as we've mentioned, there are some new innovative recycling processes uh, being developed, um, being put into markets um, and hopefully put it in, into industrial productions as well, such as the chemical recycling process we have been describing. And this really allows you to recycle endlessly, right? Um, because during the process, the contaminants um, which are present are typically completely removed. And so you end up 
with complete virgin uh, type of materials, which you can use forever and forever. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate now for a minute, though, because this whole program basically assumes that plastics can never be removed completely from the equation. Uh, are there no viable alternatives, though, like, I don't know, packaging made from organic materials that would be biodegradable, for instance? Yeah, I think very good question once more. We, we always need to think and, and apply, you know, life cycle thinking uh, whenever we choose a material to make a package. And ensure the package then and the material choice uh, meets the first objective of protecting the content, right? That's the most impactful also if you think about an, uh, an LCA for a specific product. So we don't want to move into packages that, for example, is not protecting any more food. Uh, if the food is, uh, is, is wasted, it has a huge impact, obviously a much bigger CO2 impact on the globe versus uh, packaging. Packaging is, is actually a very small contributor uh, to a life cycle assessment, but it's obviously very, very visible, unfortunately, uh, with all of the, the waste crisis, uh, movies and, and pictures we have seen lately on television. So um, I think the strategy is the first thing we need to do is to eliminate packs that we, we don't need, right? Um, we also would need to crack the business model more on reusing and refilling packages. And, and you see quite a lot of efforts. I just have shown the, uh, the head and shoulders refill pack but again you can expect much more in this area to come um, and then the third item is obviously to recycle better our uh, our packages uh, it's very very critical um, and this is true for all different packaging materials whether we're talking um, plastics uh, paper based aluminum whatever it is right now um, the alternatives, as you mentioned, compostable, let, let me also talk a little bit about, about those ones, right? So I think if we first stay within the plastics uh, area, what we could do to improve the footprint is first using a lot of recycled materials, as, as we previously described. So we can go up to 100% on the bottle and also, also in caps and others. Um, you see an increase in recycled materials as such. We also can think about making plastics out of renewable feedstock, so not necessarily oil or gas. Um, can also be made out of sugarcane um, and, and other uh, feedstock, right? So that also can be used for, for plastics. You also could uh, decide to move out of plastics, totally move out of plastics and go, for example, to fiber-based materials, so paper-based, uh, carbon cardboard-based and so forth, if it makes sense, right? But we always try to let us guide by life cycle analysis in terms of the material choice. Coming back to your last point um, on biodegradable. Um, I really can tell you that I really um, am not in favor of using these type of, of materials. I have been seeing many, many false promises that things would degrade whenever you put them on the beach or even in the oceans. Um, and it's definitely not the right material for the majority of, uh, of applications because again, once you're degrading your material, you're losing your um, useful resources, right? And in a lot of cases, even if, if people would claim something is industrial compostable, um, it's not going to compost fully in the industrial installations. Um, the reason being is that the throughput in such an industrial composting site is, for example, two hours, where in standard conditions, people claim that something will degrade in 48 hours, right? So it's, it's a partial degradation. It's not really gonna solve uh, the waste crisis in such. So um, in essence, I'm not a big fan. There, there might be some very limited amount of applications in developed countries, but I think it's really very, very limited. Um, and therefore, I think there are better material choices than versus just uh, degradable materials. But realistically, there is no real alternative at the moment, and we're not likely to see the back of plastic anytime soon. And once again, it comes back to us, as in we need to get better in how we make, how we use, how we dispose of, and how we reuse plastics. That's basically what it comes down to, right? That's correct, uh, Judy. So I think in, in essence, everyone is, is allergic against uh, plastic waste and we, we should be, right? There's not necessarily a, a problem with, with plastics as such. And I think that's where we need to make the differentiation. 
And indeed, again, once more, um, a, a, a wake-up call for, for the listeners. I mean, please do put the items into the right bins and please do not litter because if you start littering, indeed, we end up in more waste and plastic crises than um, what we already have seen so far. So I think in Europe, as mentioned, I mean, there are um, enough um, infrastructures in place and we always can, can do better, right? I mean, in the past... Um, you typically would only have collection bins um, at your house. More and more, you also see it in, in companies. You see it in uh, public uh, areas, uh, parks, but also airports, train stations, and so forth. So we all have to work hand in hand together. Governments needs to foresee the infrastructures. Consumers need to, you know, to do the right thing, uh, put it in the right bin. And then the recycling process will be taken care of um, by the waste managers themselves. So again, in Europe, the only thing we can do is to collect uh, and put more in the right bins. Um, obviously, in other regions like Southeast Asia, there is definitely uh, more work to do, specifically to foresee infrastructure. I think that's one of the big missing pieces over there, um, because today, indeed, uh, a lot of the consumers over there just put everything uh, underground or in the rivers, um, will float into the oceans, and that's typically um, the pictures of these floating waste islands that we tend to see um, on television. But again, if you can crack that one by implementing the right infrastructure, then also we can stop um, the tap on, on that one as well. Well, I, um, I want to know, though, uh, a little bit more uh, specifically from you now, when, when is it all going to happen? So if we're looking towards the future, what can we say is going to be the case in five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time? So what's the big vision of Holy Grail in the end? Very good question. So I think it's, it's very difficult to give you an outlook of the next 10 to 20 years, right? I mean, there's so much going on in, in the waste industry with, you know... Um, the producers of, of plastics, um, they're all waiting to invest in chemical recycling. They're all waiting for the legislation to be in place. So again, it's, it's difficult to give you an, uh, an outlook on, on how the industry will, will evolve. Now, but it's my belief that, as, as I was mentioning, I mean, good sorting is really um, necessary for all of the upcoming processes, unless someone would develop an, a new process that doesn't require pre-sorting or feeds the control, which I haven't seen so far. Um, in the short term, as mentioned, the national test markets, Denmark, Germany, France, will start off the summer. It's likely going to take us one year, um, one year and a half to uh, fully finalize this program. And then we're out of, of Holy Grail 2.0, as we called it. And then it's really time for adoption at scale, right? Guess what? We're already working on the adoption together with the, our funding partner, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste to making sure that whenever everything has been proven, that we're, again, not going to waste another year to convince the others, right? So that's that's really all being done in uh, in parallel. So the big vision is really truly to get out of, of improper waste management um, and conserve all of our precious resources. So recycle much more the materials versus today's numbers um, and closing loops, as I, as I was mentioning already uh, before. So... The actions obviously have to be taken now. I mean, there's quite a lot of ambitious targets being placed by, by governments, by companies, by NGOs. Um, and we, we can't simply recycle uh, our way out of this, uh, this waste problem. So uh, if you're just going to wait and sit, I mean, obviously nothing is, is going to happen. So I really do hope that I have convinced the listeners of this podcast about the importance of putting their materials in, in the right collection bins. Um, and obviously... Please do not litter uh, these useful resources. We can easily find uh, and use them as secondary materials uh, in new packaging products. Well, you've certainly convinced me even further. I'm going to have to go and process and recycle and reuse all of this information in my brain. Uh, fascinating stuff. Hian, thank you so much for sharing this information with us today. More than welcome. Thank you uh, from me as well, Hian, and uh, to all our listeners. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. Uh, and again, if you listen to the podcast and want to watch the conversation with Hian, head over to OMV's YouTube channel, or if you have feedback or questions, please write us an email to 
podcast at omv.com. Once again, that is podcast at omv.com. We would love to hear from you. Also, check out the show notes for links for more background material and cool information on Holy Grail. So that's it from us. Thank you so much for joining us uh, to Hien and to our listeners. And uh, we hope you're going to do it again. So join us for the next episode of Rethinking Resources.